Well, first of all, you know, we make choices and we make decisions. And a lot of people put out of their mind that every time we make that choice, there's a consequence, right? And the consequence can be good, bad, or ugly, or all three, actually. But with every choice we make, there comes an outcome, a consequence, or fallout. And again, you know, the person who's addicted, whatever the substance uh, may be, drug, sex, rock and roll, um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a, a draw for us. You know, we live in a world that offers lots of escapes and it's very easy to have a bad day, you know, and start drinking um, to excess or doing drugs to excess or abuse to excess. You know, there's lots of outlets available to us, again, most of them with no consequence, except to the damage it does to ourselves and to the people in our lives that we claim to love. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we are with Branch Isole. He is an author of 22 books. Uh, Branch, could you please introduce yourself? Let people know just a little bit about you, please. Sure, Ed. Thanks so much. It's great being with you this morning. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm the author of 22 books. I write for adults about contemporary life situations that virtually every adult um, comes in contact with either firsthand or through friends or family. Um, most of my material deals with relationships and you know, a lot of the emotions that we struggle with as we go through our daily lives. Um, in contact with people and events that are always, you know, experiences that are affecting us and, and possibly changing our lives, hopefully uh, in a growth-filled way. Well, that's very interesting. You know, we all deal with our day-to-day -day lives, but how we deal with them really matters. You know, the emotions behind all of this turmoil in our world it's rather uh, hostile anymore compared to when I was younger. You know, you, you would think that the Wild West was back or something. Uh, what inspired you to start writing your books, Branch? Well, that's a great question because I didn't start writing until I was 50 years old. Um, it was not something that I had ever foreseen myself doing. I was not a real avid reader, and I was not an exceptional student. So, you know, that thought of expressing ideas for others um, was never sort of in my wheelhouse. As I was in school, I was getting a master's degree in theology, and I was moved to write a book for basically fallen away Christians and seekers and searchers. In my own path, I had been raised in a Christian household, but not an active household. We were sort of C and E Christians, you know, Christmas and Easter. Um, other than that, there wasn't a lot of religious experience for me, and it wasn't part of my life. But as I grew and, and you know, got into the career workplace and 
got caught up in corporate America, um, there came a time when I was sort of disillusioned and disappointed. So I started searching for truth and what that looked like in my life. And that led me to uh, studies of Eastern religions, philosophies, and mysticism. And that eventually led me back to Christianity, but not back to the church. And so as I was getting my master's degree, um, I was moved to write a book for fallen away Christians, as I said. And that was how the writing started. Um, from there, my second book was a selection of short stories and poetry dealing with you know, life situations. And so that's how it sort of grew as a career for me. Yeah, you know, a lot of life situations from my experiences, a lot of them lack communication skills. And learning how to communicate well is very difficult, especially in our world, because nobody teaches us how to really live anymore. It's more, like you said, this corporate world that we live in. And it's all about franchising, money-making, and yeah. it's a chase. We get lost in it. <laughs> so how, how do we find ourselves within that branch? Wow, that's such a good question because as you say, you know, today, just about every activity that you come in contact with, somebody's trying to monetize it. And yes. um, I, I find that, you know, most people in, in that situation, and I hate to say, use Amway as an example, but multi-level marketing, yeah. it's that same kind of yeah. mindset of, I really don't have any experience to draw from, but I've read about this, so I think I can do it, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to charge for it. And this um, goal to monetize everything really sort of takes the personal contact and the personal communication out of the scenario. You know, life is about relationships, and one of the things we know from advanced technology that we have today is everybody's on their phone texting and they're in conversation, but not with the people standing next to them. And so this continual, you know, deep dive into the whole of isolation, you're right. You know, lots of people have lost the skill of communicating and, you know, the kind of world we live in today, truth and honesty, is not a part of that communication. So we really struggle with, you know, trying to present ideas and thoughts in a cogent way that somebody else can understand and either agree or disagree with. So we live in interesting times to say the least. Yeah, scary times also, you know, a lot of, lot of things hurling at us at the same time. And you're a believer, you know, things will speed up in the end times. So uh, I'm one of those believers myself that we are living at the edge of those times that we've always heard about. You know, people assume that we're there all the time. But if you actually pay attention to the signs and the times that we are actually living in, Everything seems to be a culminating into this great big cauldron of a melting pot. We're all in it together, no matter if you believe or not. That's, that's the thing that a lot of people are lost about. So learning to communicate is very important to me. That, that's one of the things that sent me down the rabbit hole. I didn't know how to communicate effectively. I knew how to communicate to make money and really, I, I was in that ball of corporate greed and everything. And I lost everything. I, I kinda was thrown down per se, and I was crushed into rubble. 
to form me back into concrete. And now I am such a different person because of what I've went through in my life. My belief system can't be shaken. And that's why I'm out there reaching out to people all the time and trying to find out what makes them tick. Why are we in this situation? It seems like you're kind of in that same ballpark. Yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, there's four cornerstones that we all possess. And the first one is the need for love. And, and that starts, starts obviously early on, you know, as soon as our consciousness starts as an infant, that, that desire to be loved. Um, from that, we go into this phase where, you know, we crave approval. And it starts with our parents and then, you know, our family and starts to expand outward. And then as adults, of course, you know, we're all craving approval of our peers and, and the world at, at large. And as we go through this growth cycle, uh, we soon find out that everybody has an agenda, right? And so they come in, these people come into our lives and we are often believing in and believing what we see and not looking a little deeper. And, and we end up, you know, getting beat up pretty good or getting knocked down and taken advantage of, you know, by people we didn't know or people we trusted or companies that we believed in. And we soon start to get a little gun shy until we realize, you know, everybody's got an agenda they're trying to sell me something or get something from me or do something to me that may or may not be in my best interest. And then finally, the fourth cornerstone that a lot of people are missing because they're sort of buried under layers of the world is that spiritual grounding. And a lot of people, you know, when they go through enough turmoil and trouble in their lives and sort of reach rock bottom, they finally decide, gee, I need to look someplace else. And, you know, we all have an innate connection to something greater than ourselves outside of ourselves. And what many people come to realize, but many more don't, is that's a spiritual connection that we are craving to give us purpose and understanding of why we encounter so much struggle and stress and conflict, you know, in our world, in our daily life, within our families, within our job. And so those people who are willing to, you know, pull the trigger and take that leap to look at what spirituality is and how it applies to and can affect them have that opportunity then to really start again and start growing with a little more balance in their life with both I'm living in the world, but you know, my being, my essence is actually outside of this world. And how can I make those two coexist and work for me as opposed to, you know, me going down this path where I just continually struggle and face challenge and adversity. Yeah, that's that's a struggle <laughs> every day, that fine balance that we have to find. Morals, people tend to don't even know what the word morals mean anymore. But, you know, you, you talked about you hitting rock bottom before you actually start observing. And I always look at that like the cup of wrath not being full enough yet. And that's our, that's our learning. You know, that, that's what makes us not want any more of that disgusting filth in our life. And yeah. believe me, I, I come from some pretty disgusting filthy stuff but i love every portion of my life because it made me who i am so discovery and that personal growth it's very hard 
in life, especially when you're young. Uh, you know, I'm speaking yeah. uh, from uh, an experience from a young man's perspective, but that growth period is extremely hard. And when you're, you know, 15, 16, 17, going on into those early adulthood phases, finding the person to turn to for, you know, the right values, you, you want that good moral surrounding around you. And uh, it's hard when you're that young because you're so susceptible to you know what people think of you and if i do this it's going to you know how how can you encourage a young person not to think about what people will think of them and to think about doing the right thing Wow. Um, I don't know that we can. You know, we live in a uh, world that literally bombards us every day with this material drive for wealth and stuff and therefore power. And we see it, you know, as example to us every day in the news or in your life. You know, exactly what you've just mentioned. We see people taking advantage with unethical practices or amoral or immoral behavior. And there's no consequence anymore. Um, yeah. You know, and, and this example shows young people particularly but 20s, 30s, and you know, into our 40s, when we're in that career and job market, ladder climbing kind of environment, you know, spirituality is not part of many people's lives. And as a result, we only see that one path, the world's ways, and we get caught up and assimilated into that. And our perception is this is the only way and I've got to do whatever I can do or have to do to get ahead. And instead of seeing leadership, you know, in industry, in government, in religion, in all of these other aspects of life, what we see is people taking advantage for their own greed and avarice. And even when they're caught, there's no consequence. Yeah. And as you, you know, alluded to before, we, we are in the end times and, you know, Bible prophecy tells us the things that are going to happen. And, you know, the ultimate is Isaiah 520, where he says in the end times, evil will be called good and good will be called evil. And we see that every day in our lives. And so for young people, you know, we get caught up in this movement forward, this goal-oriented life and materialism and money. And that's a that's a deep struggle that most people are going to fail at. You know, if you look at any industry, there's very few people at the top of that industry. There's a lot of people struggling, and there's a lot more people who have had a dream, but it has been crushed or they've been failed. And so they've basically given up and they don't know where to turn. And, and this is where we get a lot of people who are struggling, you know, and they fail. And then rather than knowing how or where to go to pick themselves up, instead they beat themselves up and yeah. they get deeper and deeper, you know, mired in that morass of rejection and failure. And so, you know, how do you change anybody's mind? How do you convince them that there's a different course that they can take? And, and that's the struggle and that's the question. And that's where people who've been called to service like you and I, we can do all we can do and that is simply to help people understand that number one, we identify with where you are 
because we were there also at one time. And, yeah. you know, this is what we struggled with. And this was the consequence of those choices. And we finally turned outside of ourselves. And in doing so, our life was changed. And in the way that our life was changed, your life can be changed also. But you have to make that choice. You have to take those actions. And, you know, we can help you to see that path. But you're the one who has to step on that path. So can we help people? You know, hopefully. I mean, that's why we do what we do. And all we can do is scatter seeds and, you know, trust that they'll be watered. And then, yeah. you know, we, you and I both go out there and try and help one person at a time. And, and that's our goal. If we can help one person today realize that there is a different way and get them started on that path, then we've done our job, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Poetry, you know, short stories. Yeah, you teach writing short stories. Why? Why the short stories instead of, you know, long, long stories? Well, you know, poetry in its original form was mankind's first literary adventure you know when when people lived in caves and fire was the epitome of technology for them their entertainment their teaching tool their movement forward of their culture was in storytelling and you know that's what their life was every day they struggled to survive and when it got dark they hid from the beasts in their neighborhood, lit a fire and told stories, you know, about their experiences and their culture and their tribal communication. And so as literature developed, storytelling, you know, is still the foundation of literature. And poetry at one time, um, you know, in the last 500 years, sort of had its heyday. Well, Poetry was a great vehicle for education because most people weren't educated, right? And so something that's brief and concise, but still can tell a story and have a tale or a lesson to be learned um, was the primary function of literature, you know, among uneducated villages and communities. Um, poetry sort of lost its luster you know, in the 1800s with the age of enlightenment and, and, and scientific knowledge and application. And then the industrial revolution, you know, as we've grown as, as humans and our technology has grown, our literature has changed, but poetry is still around and it's still a great vehicle because it does share a story, teach a lesson in a very brief and concise presentation. Uh, you know, it's sort of making a rebound now because everybody is so busy. You know, they want something quick. They want something brief. They want something, you know, they can read on the way to work, on the bus. Uh, they don't want to be bogged down with a 300-page novel necessarily unless they've got the time to do that. So short stories and poetry, you know, is making a comeback, especially where we have a generation with very short attention spans. So that's why I continue to write short stories and poetry. Um, you know, I'm trying to develop themes with each story, but it's got to be something that people can read and digest in just a couple of minutes. And then hopefully, if I've done my job, there's enough of a hook in there that will bring them back to it so they can read it again and think a little more about it and what it's trying to say to them. Yeah. Yeah, get the hook in the jaw and, you know, you might succeed there. So let, let's talk about how, how do we help people with the struggle of addiction and bringing them out of the addiction cycle? Because that breaks a lot of re 
relationships. You know, my my family came out of that s cycle of abusive behavior and, you know, alcoholics and drug addicts, all of that. How can we kind of help alleviate that and bring our world out of that sort of behavior? Because it's getting bad out there. There's homeless off the chart. And like you alluded to earlier, it's all about our mental capacity and what we, you know, aspire to be. And that's what we end up dead in America, dead America. That's what dead America is about. How can we help that? Well, first of all, you know, we make choices and we make decisions. And a lot of people put out of their mind that every time we make that choice, there's a consequence, right? And the consequence can be good, bad, or ugly, or all three, actually. But with every choice we make, there comes an outcome, a consequence, or fallout. And again, you know, the person who's addicted, whatever the substance uh, may be, drug, sex, rock and roll, um, there's a there's a, a draw for us. You know, we live in a world that offers lots of escapes and it's very easy to have a bad day, you know, and start drinking um, to excess or doing drugs to excess or abuse to excess. You know, there's lots of outlets available to us. Again, most of them with no consequence except to the damage it does to ourselves and to the people in our lives that we claim to love. How do we break that cycle? How do we get you know, people unaddicted? Um, well, first they have to realize that with every choice comes a consequence. You know, my primary focus is to help people get spiritually grounded and then to use that spiritual strength, okay? And even when people hit rock bottom in an addiction kind of a cycle, they may not quit. You know, it, it may take losing their life for them to become unaddicted. And so the struggle for anyone that's in that addiction cycle can be so great that they feel there's no way to overcome it. And yet they're the only ones who can get themselves clean or out of the addiction cycle. Um, and so we have to have something to replace that with. The problem with most physical addictions is they are physical addictions. But we have to remember that the mind and our thoughts, you know, our thoughts control our actions. Our actions control our habits. Our habits control our character. And our character determines our destiny. So what we have to do is, we, first of all, we've got to change the thoughts. We've got to change the mindset of the person who's in addiction. And then we have to give them an alternative to that reward that they get from the addiction. But with that reward, they already know that there's a downside that there's a fallout, that there's a heavy consequence to it. So we've got to change the mindset and then they've got to have an alternative. And this is where spirituality can become so much of a, uh, an ally to fighting addiction. We've got to have something we can put our trust in that's greater than the pull of the addiction. The reason I say this is, you know, there's, I have a program that's called Five Steps on the Stairway to Heaven. And there's only five steps. There's only five steps you need to take to get to heaven. And one of those is um, embracing three of the sayings that John has. And one of the ones that he particularly talks about for the person who has received Christ and now has the Holy Spirit within them 
how they call upon that spiritual strength in any kind of a situation. Let's say somebody's wanting to have that next drink or that next hit, you know, and, and they, their body is telling them, go ahead, you know, the little angel and the little devil, the devil saying, go ahead, it's not going to hurt you, you can do it, it's all okay, and the angel saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, and <clears throat> without that spiritual strength to show us why and how, you know, we, we tend to give in to the little devil. Well, when we have a relationship with Christ, and I'll go through the five real quick, we get a relationship with Christ by inv inviting him into our lives. Once we've invited him into our lives, he tells us he will send his Holy Spirit to be with us, to give us guidance and counseling and advice when we need it most, when we need, need to make those important choices in our lives. Number three, and this is John 16, 13, and this is the one that's so important, when we've got the Holy Spirit living with our spirit, and I'm in a situation where I want to have that drink, and I call on the Holy Spirit to advise me or counsel me, His Spirit living in within me will come and show me the truth. And the truth that He shows me is the consequences of taking that drink, okay? He's not going to show me a blessing or a reward for listening to him, but he is going to show me the future outcome and the possibilities, the consequences of taking that next drink. And based on my prior experiences, I already know what those are. You know, um, all of the negative consequences that I've experienced in the past are shown to me again for my future. Now, does this mean I don't take the drink? Not necessarily, but it gives me the spiritual strength of God himself through my belief in Jesus Christ, who has sent to me his Holy Spirit to advise me, to guide me, and to instruct me. And he does that by showing me the consequences, the negative consequences of that choice. And the great thing is, when I see those negative consequences, now I know what the alternative is. Now, I can still make the choice of whether I'm going to have the drink or not, but I have been shown the truth of what my actions may produce. And by not taking that drink, I start breaking that cycle of addiction. I start growing stronger in my spiritual grounding and my spiritual connection to God himself through Jesus. And believe it or not, the further down that path I go, I start to realize he is working in my life. And there's a reward or a blessing somewhere along the line for me not taking that drink and getting into that negative consequence. And when people do this pattern of behavior, they start to see God working in their lives, and it helps them to understand, I don't need this substance, or I don't need this inappropriate behavior to make me feel better, because now I have something that shows me the truth of who I am and who I can be. And that's the power of having a spiritual relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And, you know, there's no way we can explain this to people who are not there, but right. we can encourage them to just try it, consider it just one time and see what the result is. And the, the, the caveat is it's not going to happen overnight. And anybody who's on the spiritual yeah. path knows this. Yeah. Yeah. The second thing we know is when you start down the spiritual path, the forces of evil are, are going to be trying to pull you off of that path, you know, and they're going to do everything in their power to get you to fall away. In that situation, all you have to do is rebuke them in the name of Jesus, and they will leave you. They will leave your thought process. You want to change that desire of addiction? Change your thoughts. Think about something else. Think about the consequences of negativity that you've already experienced in your life by going down that path 
and then realized you have an option to go down a different path. Yeah, truth and consequences. <laughs> truth will set you free. The consequences always tells you that was the truth. So, you know, when we when we end our lives in an addiction, I, I really think it's a waste in so many ways. But as you said, we have to make that choice. And sometimes you have to hit rock bottom several times to make that choice. So is there anything else you'd like to add to our conversation, Branch? Wow. Where should we start? Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. we, we talked we talk briefly about the end times. And, and you and I both have that that conception that we are in the end times. You know, a lot of people um, wonder about the end times. A lot of people doubt the end times. And most people aren't really concerned about the end times because they don't know biblical scripture and they don't know about prophecy. And the, the great thing about prophecy is if the word of God is true, if you believe there's a God and he is who he claims to be and who we think he is, then we must believe that what he says is true. And if his word is true, then the things that he tells us in prophecy about what's going to happen in our world must also be true. The great thing about living in this age, and, and the end times started on May 14th, 1948. We know this because the pinnacle point of the end times is prophesized to start with the rebirth of Israel as a nation. And that's the date that that happened. So we know that we have entered the end times. Now, for the average person, <clears throat> the importance is the things that are happening in our world right now that we see on the media and the newscast every day, there's so many precursors that have to take place for the big end time events to take place. And these are all the warning signs. These are the shots across the bow of our ship that's telling us these things at the end are gonna happen and they're gonna be pretty terrific and pretty horrible all at the same time. And for you not to be caught up in that mayhem and that hell that's going to be unleashed You've got to be able to identify the things that are happening before that that cause the lead up to, you know, one of the one of the things everybody knows about is the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, right? I mean, you might not know anything about Bible prophecy or scripture or anything, but everybody has seen movies or videos about the rapture, about the Antichrist, you know, and about the, the end times, the real horrible things that can possibly take place. And for all of those things to happen, for the mark of the beast to be instituted, that means we have to have a one world economy and a one world monetary system. And for that to take place, you know, we have 12 different um, Federal Reserve Banks here in our country, and there's a couple of dozen around the world that control the flow of money. For one economy to be with one currency, right now it's like, well, that could never happen. You know, that that's impossible. Look at all the different currencies and all the different federal banks around the world. Well, there's there's things that have to happen before that big one can take place so that the mark of the beast can actually happen. And if you pay attention and you know a little bit about end times big events, then you can start to see the unfolding of these small incremental steps and these small movements forward that are changing you know, the monetary system, that are changing religions, that are changing the social structure, that are changing governments so that the big things will happen. And that's, you know, that's one of my goals is to help people understand 
These are the big ones that are going to be taking place that are going to affect every person on the planet, literally. But you can start to see the small steps that will allow these things to happen. And now's the time to get prepared mentally, physically, and most of all, spiritually. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I agree 100%. I've enjoyed our talk today. I do want you to explain one more thing to the people. I, I listened to a video. You explained your name. Could you explain why you have the name Branch Isole? Sure. Um, the first half of my life was pretty similar to most people. You know, I was on the education path, on the career path, on the job path. And then uh, I got disillusioned and I got off the corporate path and the, and the Ferris wheel. And I started talking to myself about how can I become a better person? How can I you know, be more truthful with myself and with the people in my life? And so that led me on you know, a 15 year trek through spirituality and mysticism and religions and study. At one point, I knew that I wanted to change my name from my given name, and I knew that I wanted my last name because I was on a spiritual path and, and had been called to serve. I knew I wanted my last name to be, I serve only Lord Emmanuel. And so I chose I-S-O-L-E. And at that time, I didn't realize that it was actually you know a word in use, but that was the, the monogram that I used. And I thought, well, I want my name to be Joshua. And for two years, I didn't do anything about the name change. And I, I thought about it, but never was motivated or moved to put it into action. And one day, I was doing a Bible study with a young couple. And I opened the Bible, and I looked down, and I was at Zechariah 3, 8. And that scripture says, I will raise up Joshua, my branch. And at that moment, the Lord told me, that's your new name. So I had Isole, and now I had Branch. And if, you know, if you know the Old Testament particularly, if the Lord calls to you and gives you a new name, and you accept the name, then from that moment on, you are committed to service, you know, in the, in the word and, and for the Lord. And so that's how the name change came about. And, you know, er, ever since the path has been enlightened and I continue to see him working, you know, in my life, in, in every way, in every little way, every day, I'm acknowledging his presence. And so that's how the name came to be. But thanks for asking. Well, that, that's quite a interesting name. And, and a lot of people, when they first see it, probably go, what? So, yeah, it's good to have the explanation behind that name. Uh, do you have a call to action for people? Sure. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I invite people to Google my name. Uh, you know, I've got a website. I've got a YouTube channel. I've got lots of podcasts, videos. Um, I've got lots of information out there. It's all free. Um, you know, you can buy the books, but you don't have to. That's not where it's at for me. Uh, I love readers to purchase books and then comment or write to me and say, you know, I love this poem. I hated this poem. Uh, but I, I openly, you know, encourage people to learn and to grow. And all of my efforts, the books, the videos, the podcasts, the interviews, everything is designed to help the listener or the reader look out in their world and reflect inward how they can become a better person in their life for them, for their family, and for their community. So I always say, just Google my name, Branch Like a Tree, Isole, I-S like Sam, O-L-E, and that'll give you links to everything you know that I've done. And there's only one, so you don't have to go through a lot of pages. If you just Google it, it'll come right up. And and the best way to contact you, Branch? 
uh, through my website. I've, I've got a link there. People can write to me or, or ask questions. Uh, BranchySolay.com is the website. You're a very interesting man. I wish you well in all you do. And thank you for being part of the Dead America podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, buddy. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.